Top Med Talk. Hi, it's Monty Mython here, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk. Continuing with our series of interviewing clinicians in the front line with regards to COVID-19, the global pandemic. So I've just managed to catch up with Professor Hugh Montgomery, a colleague of mine from University College London. He's a professor of cardiovascular genetics and critical care. He's got a very long list of other important roles and responsibilities he has. But this weekend, uh, he's been spending time on the intensive care unit at the Whittington Hospital in North London, looking yeah. after patients presenting with COVID-19. Hugh, how's your weekend been? Well, actually, oddly enough, I've done very much less of the um, looking after the patients. My colleague Pete has been doing that uh, excellently, of course. Um, I've been doing that boring thing of moving stuff around. So uh, we're all beginning to double up. Um, It's been one of the joys of this crisis. There are very few positives. But we are an exceptional group of people as intensivists, aren't we? Doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, etc., And my experience is there hasn't been any griping, there hasn't been any ill temper, and people are coming in to help out in every way. So I second on covered uh, the unit, but I came in and emptied the stock rooms out, removed all the stuff we didn't need, cleared the shelves, re-racked the machinery, labeled stuff up to make sure we knew where it was, because those are the really important things. While we're seeing the trickle turn into the flood that heralds the tsunami, now is a chance for those of us that aren't overwhelmed already to to make the preparations. And I, in my view, those some things are sometimes as important as as anything else is is knowing where your kit is and making sure it's labelled and so forth, and bringing buttons in for everyone, of course, as well. That's also important. Absolutely. So now, Hugh, not uh, and patting everyone on the back and saying thank you. Now, not everyone will yep. have a sense of where the Whittington Hospital is. If you could describe hmm. its geography and the surrounding population, and a little bit about the size and complexity of patients you look after. Yes, it's interesting this, isn't it? Because every we're all thinking of every hospital as being the same, and that its responses can be the same. And I think it's very, very important that we trade information uh, and work out standard operating procedures that work and learn from each other. But we also have to recognise that UCLH, where I used to work with you, Monty, you know, that was... Last time I looked, it was 40 beds. It's probably about 4,000 now. I don't know. Um, we're relatively small. So we're North London. We're about a 25-minute cycle ride north of King's Cross, um, down from uh, the Royal Free, which is a couple of miles away. So there'll be a little bit of dinging going on from WhatsApp groups. Um, yeah, a little bit further down from the Royal Free and, the, and Highgate. We serve, we're a relatively small district general hospital. We normally have 15 ITU beds, but like many other places, we haven't been able to get enough ITU nurses to man those. So we've been running a very tight ship of 10 beds um, for quite some time, running at very high occupancy. Um, So we serve a mixed and relatively poor community, whilst there are uh, the wealthier groups that maybe come up from the Highgate Hampstead area, we have a large immigrant community. Uh, we have a lot of, let's say, TB, for instance. Um, and we're pretty deprived. The area is not wealthy at all. So that's us, a relatively small unit in a relatively small hospital with staffing constraints that we all face. Um, and now having to face a challenge of, of expanding up very quickly with, of course, limited stores limited machinery and very limited particular nursing staff our, our entire nursing cohort is 52 so we'll loop back on on some of the longer term challenges in a moment Hugh. but how, how many cases have you seen at the whittington so far that you're aware of what was the sort of head count well my understanding is uh that the numbers on the wards are going up um again we're somewhat shielded because our ed and uh, acute medical teams are are being fantastic and actually shielding us from constant chasing up. But from a week and a half ago, where I think the number was zero, there were cases on the wards at the beginning of last week. To my knowledge, we were above 40, I think, by the start of the weekend on the general wards. And we've been admitting patients. Our first intensive care patient came to us on Thursday of last week. And we've had several more since. And they vary. Um, 
they vary in, in severity of illness. Uh, some have done well, or one has done well so far-ish. I've not been in this morning on CPAP. Uh, another is intubated. And then we've got one or two others of the sort of sickle community, for instance, getting into trouble and so forth. So I think this is probably a little unrepresentative, but it sort of follows the pattern that every other country has followed. And we've all watched the literature, the exponential growth phases outside China, which was draconian or Hong Kong, and maybe Japan, which has a slightly flatter curve for various reasons. Uh, in Europe and North America, we will follow exactly the same trajectory, um, pretty much identical. So I think we know that we're about to reach the inflection point when this little trickle of cases that starts to appear, unless something dramatic changes, is, is about to become a steep flood. That's not a good analogy. <laughs> It'd be a very <laughs> steep rise. Actually, apparently there are some uh, YouTube videos that my darling wife was telling me about last night that do use the flood analogy from the point of view of, of, of water and buckets, etc. So apparently that one's worth digging out to have a look at. So yeah, um, I mean it's it's yeah it's, it's certainly it's understanding, isn't it? Inflection points and yeah. exponential curves and um, you know the classic example of those when I'm trying to explain it to people. You know, I've been talking with two analogies. The first is the classic exponential curve of the chessboard problem of, you know, the, the person who was meant to save the life of an emperor who said, oh, what do you want? And they said, well, I'll have a grain of rice, the first square, two for the next, four yes, for the next, yes. eight for the next. And by the time we get to the 32nd square, not much has changed. The guy's got a paddy field full of rice. But by the time we get to 64, he's got a mountain of rice bigger than Mount Everest from sea level. Yes. Uh, and the same goes with the infection rate, really, which, as you know, with the normal flu, each person infects 1.3 people. So after you've had 10 cycles of passing it on, you've got 14 cases. Um, when you've got three per person, which is what we've got at the moment, probably, um, after 10 cycles from one person, you've got 59,000 cases. And this is, yeah, I mean, we all know this. This is what's going to hit us, is that, is that exponential rise up. And also, of course, the intensive care side that we've got an incubation period of, from what we understand on average, somewhere around six days. And it looks as if people don't really hit the critical care bit often and for another 10 days after that. So when we were all hearing about these rise of cases that were being diagnosed a week or so ago or more, that was already six days behind the curve because those people had spent six days incubating it. What we're now seeing, if compared to those counted numbers, the intensive care lot, there is this lag, six days of incubation, maybe 10 days or so before you fall off your perch. Uh, and that's why we've got this lag, but why we're going to follow the same huge change we've seen in, in total uh, terms of total population numbers. So, Hugh, I was sharing with you, and I was talking to a colleague in Hong Kong that uh, yeah. about their experience uh, and the fact that they're reasonably under control at the moment on the basis of the fact mm. that, the, that everyone kicked in very quickly based on their previous experience of being exposed to SARS, which was also mm. a coronavirus, but would appear to be much more lethal. But, yes. but, but everyone started to do the things that we're being encouraged to do now almost automatically and immediately. And comparing mm. that to the interview that follows that with our colleagues who talked to you yesterday, in Bergamo in Italy, where mm. they seem to have been quite overwhelmed and overwhelmed in a way that I don't think any of us would have been prepared for. You know, hundreds, yes. hundreds of, uh, in a hospital you, slightly bigger than yours, but with uh, mm. about 70 ITU beds, telling us that they had 500 critically ill patients mm. uh, in a mm. very, very relatively short period of time. Where do you think we're yes. on the spectrum of preparedness? Well, it, the first thing to say is, of course, I, I, I'm not sitting on a central government committee and I'm not par party to what's being said inside. Um, it's, I do know Patrick Balance a little. He was my boss at UCL. Um, and Chris Whitty I worked with uh, when he was a registrar along the way. And uh, being open about that, I think they're both exceptional individuals. Um, my general feeling without any specialist knowledge, is that we're very, very, very fortunate uh, to have them in post at this time. And they're probably having to balance a huge amount of complexity related to business and panic and human behavior and That's economics, right. along with issues related to health service. 
If I was asked my own personal opinion, and it's not informed by the complex epidemiological modelling, so I wouldn't want this to be taken as I know better, because I do trust Chris and um, Patrick and others. But my instinct is it would be very much better to be keep getting pretty much social isolation now as much as we can. I think we, we worked out that we can, to a degree, work differently. Lots of businesses and so forth can. Uh, people can work from home. Um, I usually cycle a fair bit to and from work, but a couple of weeks ago, I just decided I was going to get wet if it rained. And you know what? I got when it rained and it didn't matter. So I've been commuting that way without problems. Um, disappointingly, I walked back from the hospital on late o'clock on Saturday night and I decided to take a long walk to clear my head and walk through Camden Town. And it was just heaving with people. The bars and the pubs, it was like nothing had changed. And that cannot be a good thing at the moment because whilst those young people themselves probably aren't going to get significantly ill and probably aren't going to die from this. The problem is each one of those has got it. The numbers, given an exponential function of spread, will be huge. And we just have to protect our critical infrastructure for intensive care. And for my mind, it would be better to getting that level of social isolation now. And I think if it were explained in that way to the public, they'd get it. If we were told, look, you're probably at low risk, but it's all about just having the beds for the people who need it. And you love the NHS. Perhaps you could just help us out in this way. And this is why I think people would get that. Whereas at the moment, the last few weeks, I've had lots of very confused people saying, well, if it's that mild, I probably want to get it now and get it over with. Or it's clearly a fuss over nothing because it's only very sick old people who get it. Or... Um, it's mass panic. I saw a meme going around the other day saying the people who make the panic make the pill, as if this was some sort of drug company engendered stuff. I think if it was just explained in the way that you and I would explain it, I think the public would go, yeah, okay, I get that. I'll, you know, I didn't have to be too draconian, but I won't go to the pubs and the clubs. I'll stay a couple of metres away from other people. I'll elbow bump them, elbow to elbow, or I'll knuckle bump them. I will wash my hands. Um, but what I won't do is cram myself into restaurants and pubs and clubs and bars and coffee shops and go endlessly to shops and touch things that millions of other people are touching without washing their hands. And I think if we had instigated that, perhaps my feeling would be a bit more aggressively just now, that might be to our advantage. Because it, it, it seems if we compare the stories from around the world that we're getting so far, is that if one is unlucky enough to get COVID-19 and end up needing in-hospital support, which yes. is, is a minority of people who would appear to be exposed and get the virus. It's quite a spectrum of response. But yes. if they do need support, it seems as though that support is often very successful. So yes. therefore, it appears as though we do in intensive care have plenty to offer. The challenge is we already are starting with extremely low number of critical care beds in the UK. We can't yes. staff all of them from baseline. They're usually completely full. Therefore, yes. this is going to be tricky if we don't take the heat out of the whole thing. And That's exactly right. That's exactly right, Monty. The, the minting more ventilators, when we need them, that's a good thing. I'm, as we're all doing, trying to teach, you know, get a five-year intensive care training to people in a few hours so they can help out. It, it, it's, a, it's nothing more than classic public health, isn't it? That it is much, much more efficient to curtail cigarette smoking, then it has spent lots and lots of money on ambulances and primary interventions for coronary angiography and stenting. Um, th th this is, though, a not much quicker and bigger event than that very slow burn sort of public health. So turn the tap off is much easier than, I think, trying to make more buckets and get people bailing harder. Mm. And I, I would... Um, wish it to be slowed down. And I think the general public will get it because if it's presented in that way, it doesn't spread panic, which I think has been partly what may have led to the messaging we've had. If instead of saying, you're not all doomed, you're not all going to drop down dead, but for the very few that need our support, it's really successful if we're able to deliver that care. Yeah. But we just would rather ration that out over the next months than have huge numbers coming at once. 
Yeah, exactly. That's all. And also, of course, we don't really know that being in a hospital bed that's not an ITU bed, we don't really know how much difference that makes. If you're elderly and there's no one to care for you and do the shopping and you can't look after yourself, then you need to be somewhere where that can happen. Um, if you're a bit hypoxic, does it really make much difference to get your SATs to 94 compared to 89? I suspect it probably doesn't. I can't prove that. Um, but really what you're doing there is just to watch, to see who falls off their perch, aren't you? That's why you're going to a hospital bed. Um, yeah, we've written if, quite, we've written together with others have written quite a lot about this in the last few years, Hugh. I don't want people yes. to interpret it the fact that we're suggesting that we wouldn't care for people and look after them. Quite. It's just that crit Absolutely. Crit critical care is not a, not a, a treatment, is it? It's not, it's not a cure. It's a splint. It's a, it's a support system to enable people to get better if they can get better. But it's That's exactly right. So it's not the, the stapling the bones together. It's the plaster cast that lets the bones knit, isn't it? Yeah. But it's a pretty, pretty tough environment and not necessarily right for everybody. Yes. Um, and again, you're quite right, Monty. I, know, I don't think either of us would want those comments gravely misinterpreted. So on a brighter it note, is. Hugh, it's, um, you know, we are, as you say, privileged to work in this global family of uh, critical care providers alongside of our other wonderful oh, colleagues and clinicians. Um, hmm. th there's been a, a few little bit of negative social media, uh, Twitter activity going on making, I think, inappropriate noises about um, what, what our attitude to all of this. I get the impression from everyone I talk to is they're very, very positive and up for doing what we do every day of the week, which is uh, doing our best to look after other people. That's my experience. I've, I've not yet met in my own trust a single person who isn't anxious, yes, isn't scared, certainly, isn't worried that we won't manage as well as we might but on a personal basis, is not for working together as we all do in time of crisis, because this is the sort of generic thing we're trained for. It's not the specific. None of us have seen this before. But we're all good at sticking together, supporting each other, helping each other out, not getting shouty. Uh, and that's our great strength. And in fact, one of my nursing colleagues with whom I've worked for years since I was a trainee, actually, <laughs> way back in the day, was saying, do you know what? It's a bit like getting the band back together. Do you know what I mean? It's there's there is a little bit, not of excitement, not of enjoyment, but going if if we all have to go into battle, then there's no finer group of people to go into battle with. And we are very fortunate in critical care. And I have to say, of course, for the NHS too, and it is it is I mean a reminder, isn't it, that by not having a fragmented health system as they do in a lot of Italy that we have a national health system with a national public health service, um, that has to be a good thing. It has to be a good thing. Now, every cloud has a silver lining. And mm. um, the I think great from the point of view, I mean, here we are talking into our computers from our own homes and continue yes. to share that information with the world via a podcasting platform. Um, right. I think this is uh, quite an uh, opportunity, not only for us to get better at the containment of these type of viruses and other diseases that are likely to come at us more frequently, and I think we can learn from the Hong Kong experience there, but also mm. an opportunity to do uh, better by the environment. You know, a lot of planes are going to stop flying, and some people have already seen the air clear up a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm looking at a set of slides here, Hugh, that says carbon-friendly conferences Monty Mython and Hugh Montgomery dated the 30th of June, 2008. So, Goodness. So People might listen now. <laughs> well, um, uh, let me so, yes, I, mean, I think that there is a message here, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, sorry, Monty, I cut across you. So, again, keep, say, keep look, going and then I'll... This is, this is an obvious idea for lots, of, for lots of people, but this is a great stimulus to crack on with it, isn't it? It is. So, I mean, if you look at this in the round, and, and you know, I profess my interest in climate change and environmental matters, which I've been proselytizing about for a long, long time. But if you look at the origins of this, this was humanity mistreating its environment in the first place, plundering wild animals, caging and kettling them for no good reason. You do not have to eat bats, and you certainly don't have to cage them with pigs and pandolins and chickens with shit and fur and feathers going everywhere and think that that's in any way a good idea. That reckless disregard of the environment is where, with what's got us into this 
situation in the first place. Then we have this idea that all of us can just hop on a plane any time we like, and there's fine, and there's no consequence for doing it because it's somehow our right to do it. That carbon dioxide is poisoning our planet, and if this doesn't get us, the climate change will in the future. It's unnecessary, but we've all got used to it as being some sort of right that we have and that there won't be any consequences. But what we're seeing now is the consequence of spreading pandemics incredibly quickly. We're also seeing the fact that our global economic system still has to value money and growth above everything. Because I think we would all recognize that if no one had been stupid enough to kettle these animals together in the first place, we wouldn't have a trouble. If they had, if airlines had shut down quickly and briskly and everyone had acted fast, we may not be where we are now. But instead, it was a question of, oh, well, you know, there's a threat to the airline industry if we don't. Well, the airline industry is going to have collapsed very shortly. Um, when we reboot from this, we've got to make sure we reboot not with Planet 1.1. It's got to be a completely different software program. Because my worry is that in a year's time, there will be a need for economic stimulus. And that economic stimulus will be, it's a five pound flight to Bali. All the hotels are 15 quid. Let's get the hospitality and travel industry back on its feet. Let's carry on as we did before. And we cannot do this. This could be an opportunity to reset the way we live, to value different things like we were talking before we went on air monthly about this business of social isolation does not mean being in a prison cell london is going to have few buses it's going to have clean air to breathe less traffic and little noise you and i will be able to meet up if we ever get off the unit and go for a nice stroll through regent's park and down maybe to oxford street and it's going to be a joy to be able to share each other's company as opposed to what we might have otherwise done which is had pollution and noise in a racket and tried to meet in a, in a congested pub or one or other is hopping on an aeroplane to go to a different place. So maybe this is a chance for us all to little, reflect a little on what's important to us and to the planet we wish to between, bequeath to our children. And, and gathering in, in pubs and clubs and stuff will come back because social interaction is yeah. important. But I'm actually Good. looking out, over, out from my study of my house over the park at the moment. And I've hmm. seen numerous people socially isolating out there together, if you see what I mean. They're, they're, yes. walking, they're walking two metres apart and they're, they're chatting away and they're enjoying the fact that the sun is shining at the moment. Well, that's exactly right. And I think we need to get that message out, don't we, to people. To say that social isolation does not mean solitary confinement in a flat that you've turned into a prison cell. It just means when we're out with people, we keep our one and a half to two metre distance um, if you're out in the fresh air, it is highly unlikely you're going to be able to spread the bug too readily, and you're certainly not going to be touching loads of things that other people have touched or will be touching shortly afterwards. So the risk of spreading contagion from going for a cycle ride with your mates or going for a walk in the park or going down with some friends to play frisbee and washing your hands after you wash play with the frisbee just in case someone's like, that's that's all good, right? This is exercise, it's fresh air. Um and in fact, again, you know, if we're looking at the positives, rather than people being kettled in a house and ordering endless, uh, you know, takeaways to be delivered to the door, bearing in mind how long the virus lasts on cardboard and the number of people who have handled things that you've got no control over, what about the opportunity to, you know, get some healthy food in and cook together as a family? And, you know, there could be positives to come from this, I think. There could be, if people re-engineer the way they consider it. And that's not, by the way, to say that there are positives for patients who are ill or for the doctors, nurses, and others in the MDT. This, I get, is going to be horrid. Horrid, horrid, horrid. There are no wins for those people. But for society more generally, that's all perhaps reflect on what's important. Now, um, agree with all of that, Hugh, and I'm going to send you that slide set, by the way. I'm sure you've got it somewhere, but it's... Uh, it, it... I probably haven't, actually. I've... I was finding the other day our give and take conference when we first started postulating in the mid nineties that oxygen use was about consumption, not delivery. And uh, I was thinking about that. That took twenty two years to catch on. Uh, well, let's hope we turn out being to be right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> be the first yes, time that we right. met. So, Hugh, uh, a little bit of um, uh, 
signposting some of the excellent resources that various different societies and colleges have put together. I'm sure everyone's aware of them already, but there's been a great national effort, I think, amongst our various different societies, faculties, colleges to, to, to share some info. Well, there has been. You've got the web links. I mean, it, this was an effort we've all engendered last week. And again, it's another example of the fact that in a time of crisis, people behave ever more decently with each other and more and more collegiately, which is always good. So the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, Royal College of Anaesthetists, the Intensive Care Society, which you know I'm um, on the executive of, all got together to create a national web portal. The Intensive Care Society has a slightly different one. It's not in competition at all. It's just designed to serve a slightly different purpose. But both of those, Monty has got the links in front of them. I haven't, so I can't read them out. Um, but the idea is to try to pool as much of that resource in one place as we can so that it makes it easy to quickly look something up by section to go, what do I need to know about PPE? What do I need to know about obstetrics? What do I need to know about CPR? Whatever it might be. And you can quickly find it in one place rather than having to hunt the web. Um, I would encourage people to be listening to some of the podcasts. I've listened to several coming out of Italy. The European Society of Intensive Care Medicine's um, webinars have been very helpful. I've listened to the last two of those, and they've been really good. There's another this Thursday at four o'clock, I think, um, uh, and they're very helpful to hear first-hand accounts of, of what's going on. So those have been my, my main resources. Um, there have been some good syntheses of the current literature, um, which are doing the rounds. And um, I was sent one that was produced by Kings the other day. It's absolutely excellent. A, a really, really excellent summary of all the relevant papers. So, and I think, you know, vehicles like yours, Monty, the top med talks serve a really huge purpose because I'm certainly an avid radio listener. And um, if I'm ever at home, Radio 4 is always on. So these sorts of things are very good ways of spreading, um, uh, spreading information. Uh, but the main ones I've been going for are the, are the uh, say, the college, joint colleges and intensive care society one, intensive care society one itself and the, uh, uh, yeah, those are the major major ones, I think. I think if I'm just doing a test search, if you search any of those bodies, then you get the cross-link and signpost to each other. There's a wealth of information. Uh, and we know, a, I mean, Google have been involved in this very helpfully, and we know that they've modified their search engines to try to make it easy for any particular person that their search comes up best for them. So if you're known to be a doctor or you're known to work in a particular area or you run particular searches, um, Google, I know, are trying to optimize the engine such that when you search for something, you get the information you need most relelevantly. So three cheers for them. Oh, I declare an interest, by the way, I have, I have consulted, so that don't, don't take that as being uh, free advertising. But, but that's been a very helpful thing. And I know that Microsoft and the other tech giants are also doing everything they possibly can to, to pitch in and help as well. Now, um, Hugh... Um I'm longer in the tooth than you by just a whisker. Um, we, by just a whisker. We, we've seen lots of this sort of stuff before. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite as potentially overwhelming as this. But we must oh. remind each other that it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. And therefore, we need to keep our energy levels up. And it's okay to rest in between shifts. And it's okay to consider re-volunteering for duties. But in weeks and months to follow, there will be significant fatigue amongst our younger colleagues. And, and it's, a, it's, it's not a sprint. This is, re yeah. this is really important, Monty, and, and I don't have an answer for it because we don't know how this is going to play out. And I certainly it feels, as I was alluding to earlier, that there's that, you know, that we watch the tide get sucked out and we've known, ooh, something bad's coming, and now the tide's coming back in, and we know what that means, that there's probably a tsunami following it. And we don't know how we're going to respond. Certainly in our, you know, we have, I'm one of six consultants in this relatively small intensive care. But to play our part, we can't just be ringing up other hospitals going, hello, can we send you yet another patient? We're going to have to step up to the plate. We don't know how we're going to do that. We don't know how we're going to run the rotors. We don't know how many people we'll need. We don't know how many people we can train. Um, and so my feeling is I'm sort of emotionally prepared for a fairly bloody start. And I'm hoping then that we will be able to establish a new normal where we are able to get some time off and see our kids and our friends and 
I think that is going to be desperately important because if we get subsumed into this constant turmoil, if that's what happens, um, we, we won't be functioning correctly and well later on. So I don't have an answer to how that's going to work, but you're absolutely right, Monty. We've all got to keep our eye on the board to say, how can we best give ourselves time? And also, I think the other thing is to try to make it easy for people to share what they're thinking and feeling, because people's thresholds for emotional distress will vary. And we can't have people feeling you know, that it's okay to say, I'm not feeling very well, I think I might have flu to get a few days at home, because that will confuse things. But it should be okay for people to say, I'm really sorry, I'm trying to marshal my own mental health here. And I just have to have a few days to get myself back to full strength. And and if we, we've got to encourage people to be open about that. That's not going to be a sign of weakness. Hmm. Yeah, that's going to be a sign of strength. And, and we mustn't, we must let people vocalize those things and support them when they say it. Yeah. I think I can already feel people saying, "Well, look, you two old men are sitting at home chatting to each other, being self-congratulatory over Skype or whatever technology is being used." But it strikes me the crazy thing to do is to um, to all gather in the hospital to discuss what might happen because the uh, opportunities for transfecting and taking a whole load of us out by doing that, when we could all be on the phone. Instead, unless well, we're actually I, I, yeah, I shall lines, be in yeah. at lunchtime, um, which is now. I shall be yeah. going in shortly for you know to carry on. Um, we're trying to make sure we've got a sort of old groups together where it's clear we've fleshed out what needs doing, and then everyone goes away and does their thing. Shake down. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to pretend, and I know that you aren't. That we're some gurus who know it all because I haven't got Scoobies here. We're all we're all making it up and. Other people will be doing it vastly better than I am by miles. But from experience of age, it's certainly true that I, I think sometimes minimizing lines of communication. So we say we're trying to get a low group together in the morning where the ED, emergency medics, us, et cetera, have a quick chat. And then each person can feed in what their tribe has to say and can take the message back to their tribe. And they can do that verbally too. Um, It doesn't have to be by this this sort of snowstorm of of WhatsApp that we've all experienced last fortnight, which has been very helpful. But we ought to be able to strip that down a little bit, I think, so that individuals communicate with their groups verbally when the people are in. But as you say, with simple collated messages um, going out. And again, you and I remember as house officers that we try to encourage nursing staff on the wards to just have a book where they wrote a long list of all the jobs that needed doing. And then when we came around, they say, oh, hello, Monty. There are 27 Venflons and X drug charts and so forth. And again, we're just trying to simple things like that for my chief exec and my medical director, who are fantastic. But what they don't need is 10 emails from me. Um, so I'm giving my questions in a list when they're non-critical, non-time critical, to one person who I know is going to have a meeting with those people every day or two, which allows them to represent those questions all in one go. So again, I'm not pretending that this is some very well thought out system. It's just little things to be aware of to try to to minimise the pressure on our colleagues, I think. Right. Well, Hugh, thank you very much indeed for your for your time. Uh, Please stay in touch. If it's okay with you, we'll touch base on a on a regular basis, not in an overwhelming way. But you know, if there are any Uh, sentinel points and or just a a catch up as the weeks pass to see how it's all going but but thank you very much for everything that you're doing I'd be delighted Monty and I should just also say a huge thank you to the other people who are actually far ahead of us because the last few weeks providing us with these information and WhatsApp groups and online you know has been a huge value so what I'm recapitulating to a degree is what other far far more informed and better people have to say so thank you to all of them you're here to that. Right, cheers, Hugh. Take care, Hugh. Bye-bye. Cheers, Monty. Bye-bye. Top Med Talk. It's Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. 
That's www.topmedtalk.com.